Hi, this is my first video of the year. It's going to be a bit of a different kind of video than you would normally see on this channel, which will be more in the game design and game analysis side of the industry rather than game electronics, which is kind of what we're going to be looking at today. I've been having fun playing with my relatively newly built Mister, but it has brought up some issues with the current retro emulation and retro gaming landscape. It's been really great to see a resurgence in new hardware for playing old games. Although there were some earlier versions of the multi-in-one direct-to-TV consoles, really, the Atari flashback set the tone decades ago for this mini or classic console resurgence. These plug-and-play consoles are awesome, especially to get people who've never had the opportunity to experience what those older consoles were like, but with some modern creature comforts, like the ability to hook up to a TV with HDMI. I'd love to do a deeper look at these flashback or mini consoles in another video. If you're interested, let me know in the comments. Unfortunately, most of these mini consoles have been limited time releases, and they do have their limitations. But as this initial wave of new non-expandable consoles has started to peter off a bit, we've seen a different segment growing in an attempt to fill this retro gaming void. Emulators have been around for a long time, but recently we've seen a new wave of emulator-based consoles appearing on the market. We've even seen a brand new release of Atari's 7800, marketed as the 2600 Plus, because the 7800 was backwards compatible with the 2600, which was a more popular console than the 7800. And this device can actually play original cartridges, and it's made by Atari. Field programmable gate array chips, or also known as FPGAs, are primarily used for hardware prototyping. But as their costs have come down to consumer purchasable levels, we've even started seeing some hardware emulation happening. I'm not an electrical engineer, but I'm starting to teach myself a bit about it because I find it really fascinating. I've done some console repairs, and I thought the Mr. Console sounded like a really cool idea. For me, the challenge of putting it together and getting it working seemed worth it. I've brought up the Mr. a few times now, so what is it? Well, this is mine here, and the Mr. FPGA is an open source project that currently uses the DE10 Nano to emulate old consoles, arcade machines, and PCs by programming the FPGA on board to act like the original hardware. What I've got here is a PC fan intaking air, which gets funneled through a custom shroud under the included plastic plate and exhausts out the back. This is a lot of advantages over software emulation because it can more accurately mimic some of the quirks of the original hardware and theoretically has less lag as games running on the chip don't have to be then reinterpreted by an additional software layer. The name Mister was derived from an earlier project called Mist, which stood for Amiga ST, which was specifically built to emulate the Amiga and Atari ST PCs. Supposedly, the added tur on the end came from it being moved to a Jurassic board, but it sounds like they might be dropping that meaning as it appears that there is consideration expanding beyond the DE10 Nano. And while the advantages of the setup have been great, not having to pull out and hook up all my old consoles and find the copy of the game that I'm looking for in a box somewhere in my storage, there has been one thing that has come up numerous times that has been frustrating. In this current landscape with all these new devices, first and second generation controls are simply not found on new controllers, which can make some games nearly impossible to play and otherwise just doesn't give you a good feeling for how the game was really played on its original hardware. Modern controllers have their lineage traced back to originally the Donkey Kong Game & Watch, this is not that one, um, which has basically the NES control layout, uh, as you can see here. This is pretty close to what would evolve into the NES, or SNES controller, and if you look at this controller, you can see how it's pretty much the same as what we ended up getting later with the Xbox and kind of more modern controllers, um, with the only real additions being the analog sticks and an extra set of 
shoulder buttons. The issue is that Gen 1 and 2 consoles didn't use a control scheme like this at all. First generation controls typically used a knob based potentiometer. Rotating it in a direction only rotates so far. In games like Pong, this would move the player's paddle upwards or downwards on the screen. This here is another first generation console, but instead of using a knob, it uses a slider style potentiometer. Here is a typical knob based potentiometer. Again, you can rotate it in a single direction until it stops or rotate it back the other way. Here you can see the inside of a case where a bump hits the bit of plastic on the knob to prevent it from rotating too far. What's actually going on here is that there are metal contacts that wipe across a resistive sheet. This changes the strength of the electrical signal that makes its way from the pins as they move around the plate. In this second generation controller, you can see the wheel turns all the way around. How is this done? There's no potentiometer here. Instead, what you can see is this plate that moves and goes through this optical sensor. This sensor sees when a hole passes by and reads the motion based on the movement. More typically, at the start of the second generation, we saw controllers borrowing from the arcade and moving towards using joysticks as the main driving mechanism. These controllers also usually had just one or two buttons, as you can see here with this TI-994A controller. The disadvantage of this was that these joysticks used button or switch presses to determine the left and right or up and down movement and lacked the fine detail control you could get with a potentiometer. Both of these controllers used this 9-pin Atari joystick connector, which was common for most consoles of the era. However, the pin layout wasn't always the same, resulting in mixed compatibility. This was used all the way into the Sega Genesis, a full two generations later. This ColecoVision controller, which came out a few years after the Atari 2600, used the same 9-pin connector. However, this controller contains a full number pad, a joystick, and side buttons. So how did they get all of these different components to work on just nine pins? They didn't. The number pad and the joystick were basically not usable simultaneously. Also, there is a way to sort of cheat button mapping to use fewer pins. If you were to wire each button individually, you would need two wires per button. One coming from the console and going to the button, and one coming from the button going back to the console. So I'd need 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 times 2 wires, or in other words, 24 total. So how else could this be done? By plotting out the buttons in rows and columns, you can greatly reduce the number of wires. This layout is also called a matrix. By running a single wire to each row and each column, you can still track all of the buttons. But in this case, we reduce our 24 wires down to just seven. This will work with our nine pins, but it doesn't account for the four buttons needed for the joystick and the additional two side buttons. Coleco was smart and basically put the keypad on the same circuit as the joystick, which allowed for the same connector to be used, but also meant you couldn't use the two different components at the same time. Now, if we look at a modern controller, there's nothing that really simulates a potentiometer. Well, many joysticks actually use two, one for X and one for Y. It's a bit of a different feel and they write themselves, so it doesn't quite work the same. We also don't really have a logical way to map a number pad. Each game could use this differently, so you could, for example, map 2, 4, 6, and 8 to the D-pad, and maybe 1, 3, 7, and 9 to the ABXY, and then like the start and select buttons to star and pound, and maybe a trigger or a joystick press to be zero, but that would only make sense for games using the number pad as a D-pad. But if you had something that used it like a numeric input, this would drive you crazy. Now I was thinking of using a Raspberry Pi Pico to put together a controller with all of the common controls for these early generations. To get started, I wanted to test getting a number pad working, and that means acquiring a number pad. So I went to a nearby thrift store and picked up a number pad for five bucks. This is the pad I picked up. It's a USB keypad made by Targus, who's been around a long time. I figured an older brand would use a standard configuration for a keypad matrix, 
but this thing confused me a bit. If you understand what I'm about to show you, please let me know in the comments. You see, I would expect that you would lay out the keypad with rows and columns just like I was talking about earlier. And you just figure out how to assign the zero in this case to either the one or two column and the enter to be either on the one or zero row. So I'm expecting to see nine pins, five for rows and four for columns. But here I can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So where are these two other pins going? Let's explore how this keypad functions. Taking out the circuit, we can see how the buttons work. When you press a button, it pushes down a pin in the back. These pins press together the two contacts on two sides of a folded sheet with a printed circuit on it. This is divided by a sheet with holes cut in it to create a gap for when they are not being pressed. So not knowing much about this, I'm looking at how a matrix is set up, and I would expect then that you would probably lay your pins out so that the first set of pins would be your columns, and then the next set would be rows, and in this situation where you have a two-sheet wraparound, that you would simply route one set of pins straight across to the other sheet and have those then chop out into rows or into columns, whichever way you're trying to do it, and then the other ones would just stay on the other sheet and do their either rows or columns, and it would be pretty straightforward and use probably the least amount of ink you could do. I would expect that the next most sensible way to go about things would be to potentially alternate the pins so that maybe you do row one, then column one, then row two, then column two, etc. Um, uh, or in programming st terms, you'd probably start at zero, but you get the idea. They sort of did neither. It alternates, but seems to arbitrarily set up the first pin, and then the last two are just rows, but it's laid out in a way that's sort of crazy. I, I did a quick diagram to try to make sense of it and figure out how each key would be recognized, just so I could read it. And this, to me, looks insane. On the left, I've written out every pin, whether it should be treated as a row or column, and the symbols affected by it. I used greater than to represent tab and less than to represent backspace. And on the other half of the page is all of the pins and where they route to across the two pages as they are splayed out. As you can see, they only have a couple rows and columns that are even remotely close to the way I'd expect. The only complete column is 0258 slash, and the only complete row is zero and period. In every other row or column, they have included or excluded a button, and it seems somewhat random as to how they determine this layout. This is another view I made showing just the connecting lines to better visualize the two connections needed for each button. This is where I realize that there's at least a little method to the madness, in that most of the non-number buttons were either on their own row or column, but I still don't understand why you wouldn't just lay this out in a more straightforward manner. If you understand why they laid it out like this, I would love to know. I haven't started the process of actually testing this on a Pico yet. I've got some stuff to test and set up first, and it might take a little while. But I also picked up a bunch of switches for use for typical buttons and maybe a D-pad. Anyways, I'll get another video about this done sometime in the future. But this is a big rabbit hole, and I've only just started to go down it, and I thought that this was interesting. It seems Atari has realized this issue recently as well, and are releasing a new handheld gaming console with similar features to address the Gen 1, Gen 2 issue, including a knob for playing Pong-style games and a number pad, which is great. I'm hoping that you can use this thing as a controller as well. Unfortunately, we just don't know if we're going to be able to use this as a controller and it is lacking a couple features of more modern controllers, so it's not going to be useful for every single console that you can emulate on the Mister or in whatever capacity you're looking at using it for. So I'm still going to try to figure out my own way forward here. But 
it is really cool to see that there is finally some ground being broken on how do we address the gap in these controllers. Thank you for joining me on the start of this journey. If you know of any controllers that solve these problems I'm running into, I'd love to read about them in the comments. I do hope someone solves this for me because I'm sure whatever I do will not be perfect. But I'm happy to learn about these things regardless. So please follow me on this channel if you want to see more videos on the progress of this, or if you just want to see more videos on game design based content. Cheers.